Well, thank you, Mark. It's good to be with everyone. Is the microphone on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Well, these are our exciting times. Uh, God is stirring up the world um, and reshuffling the deck in, in many ways. Uh, but I think all of this is a part of God causing all things to work together for our good, which is to conform us into the image uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's putting us out of our comfort zone, but it's causing us, I think, to have more of an eternal perspective uh, for us to look away from this world and to be looking to the world to come and causing us to put our trust and faith in the Lord more so than if everything was just working out according to its own routine. So we should embrace times like this as a part of God's sovereign plan. Uh, we just sung of His sovereign plan. And God uh, is at work. Uh, God is always at work in this world. And it is to build His church and to conform us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. So it is so good to see so many people here this morning. Last Sunday, uh, I've been in Los Angeles the last several weeks, and last Sunday I preached in a large tent that would hold about 1,500 people, and there probably were about 2,000 people jammed into this tent. And I was able to preach there in Los Angeles. And the Sunday before that, I preached at an outdoor fountain, uh, in a large plaza area. So uh, the Lord is, is putting his church in various different locations, but the word still goes forward, and the kingdom of God still advances no matter what. In fact, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the building of the church. Uh, the church is the most resilient institution that there is in the world. Nothing can stop the church even persecution against the church only, um, only mobilizes the church and strengthens the church. It, it was the persecution in the book of Acts that really thrust the church out of Jerusalem to fulfill the Great Commission. So God was using even those times of difficulty for a far greater purpose. And who is to say what God is doing uh, in this very hour uh, in this world, but most specifically in the church, as he is strengthening us and deepening our roots in him. So, uh, I want to begin by reading the passage. I want you to have your Bible open so that you can follow along. We're in John chapter 11, and today we are looking at verses 28 to 37, and so as is our practice, I want to begin by reading the verse, just so you'll have it in front of your eyes, have it placed back uh, into your heart. I'll pray, and then we will look more carefully at these verses. I'm reminded that the preacher has nothing to say apart from the Word of God, and that when the Bible speaks, God speaks, and so we want to hear from God in His Word. So John chapter 11 I want to begin reading in verse 28. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, 
Could not this man who had opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? This is the reading of God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Let us go to him in prayer. Father, you've already spoken to us in your word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And so we are hungry for your word. We are thirsty to take in your word because in your word is life, is truth. Your word is the means of grace by which you pour your your love and your joy and your peace into our hearts, by which you strengthen us and enable us to live for you and to serve you. And so we ask this day humbly, with open hearts before you, bowed low before you, would you use this somewhat interim passage in the middle of the chapter to speak to our hearts today and use it most effectively, meet with each and every one who is gathered here today exactly at our point of need, meet with us exactly where we are in our walk with you, and use these verses to make us more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In these verses, we find an extraordinary insight into the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we think of the Gospel of John, the principal motif in the Gospel of John is the deity of Jesus Christ. And we saw that in the very first verse of the entire book. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But also in the Gospel of John are extraordinary insights into the humanity of Christ as well. And we saw that in the opening prologue as well in John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this is really at the heart of Christianity. And it's what really is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. It is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was truly God and truly man. He was uniquely the God-man. And in this passage, John chooses to draw our attention to the humanity of Jesus Christ. We read in the rest of the New Testament that Jesus was born of a woman in a human body. He grew in wisdom and stature with God and men. He hungered and ate. He fasted and prayed. He was tempted He grew physically weary and had to sit down. He was thirsty. He slept. He had real human emotions, as we see in this passage. He he was troubled. He was moved. He was angered. And we read that he was the son of man. That he was the son of David. That he was a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. That he was the second Adam. He was Jesus of Nazareth. And so in Jesus we see his. We see perfect humanity. We see humanity without flaw. And without sin. This is in many ways what we were intended to be. And what Adam once was. Before the fall. Here is Jesus in this passage, tender and compassionate and sensitive and loving and kind and and merciful. And as we see this, this is what God desires each one of us to be. As we walk as Jesus walked, uh, we are to be moved as Jesus was moved. We are to be filled with compassion as Jesus was filled with compassion. So this is what I need to be. This is what you need to be as we look at the humanity of Jesus Christ. 
Now, we pick up this narrative in the middle of the chapter, and as you know from these past weeks, Lazarus had become sick, and they sent for Jesus. Mary and Martha did, and Jesus purposely delayed. In fact, he said, Lazarus is sick, and I am glad, because God had a far greater purpose. And Jesus at last came in God's perfect timing after Lazarus had died. It was God's design that Lazarus die at that moment. And when Jesus came, Martha went out to speak to him and said, if you'd only been here, Lazarus would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And, 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 and Martha said, sure, there will be a final resurrection. And Jesus said, as if to say, you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. And Martha gave one of the most powerful confessions of faith. Faith, She said, yes, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so we now pick up the narrative at at verse 28, really in the middle of this scene. It's really almost like scene four or scene three in this unfolding drama. And there are four features of the humanity of Christ that come out in these verses that I want you to see. And it really reveals a sight of Jesus that we don't always see or think about. But this is good so that we have a a full understanding or fuller understanding of, of who he is. And the first thing I want you to note beginning in verse 28 is his sensitive spirit. His sensitive spirit. I think you will see this as he is so sensitive toward Mary. In verse 28, we read, when she, and that refers to Martha, when when she had said this, and that this refers to verse 27, this glorious confession, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who has come into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister. Now, you recall Mary was the one who earlier in Luke 10 had sat at the feet of Jesus. She was more contemplative. She was more quiet. And Martha was always quick to take action. And so Martha, the, the, the one always on the move, calls to her sister Mary, who is contemplative, saying secretly, the teacher is here. He's calling for you. She said this to Mary secretly, and it's not stated in the text, but it is, I think, right to imply from this that Jesus has told Martha to tell this to Mary secretly, because Jesus wants to meet with Mary secretly. Uh, he, he, He does not want to have a public meeting with her. He he wants to talk to her one-on-one, and and this is part of his sensitivity. We we would say today, this is not a time for a photo op, for a a public display. Uh, This is a time for Jesus to meet alone with Mary. And so Martha says, the teacher is here, he's calling for you. Just pause for a moment, the teacher That's how disciples referred to Jesus. The word disciple means student or learner. It's only natural that she would refer to Jesus as teacher, but not just a teacher. Please note, the teacher. She understands that Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, is the greatest teacher who has ever walked on the earth. He is the source of all truth. And the teacher is here, and he's calling for you. And so Jesus takes the initiative to to call to, to Mary in order that he could comfort her. And Jesus wants to meet with her alone to console her and to comfort her. Uh, Jesus is being much like the Holy Spirit here who is referred to as the comforter. And the Holy Spirit is really just another 
person in the Godhead like Jesus, possessing all of the same attributes. And J- Jesus here desires to, to comfort the broken hearted and to draw near to the one who is, who is suffering. Jesus is the one taking the initiative here. And in verse 29, and when she, Mary, heard it, <laughs> she got up quickly. In fact, got up is used earlier in John's gospel in chapter 2 for the resurrection. She, Mary just popped up immediately and jumped to her feet, almost as if she had been resurrected. Yeah, she got up quickly, meaning immediately, and was coming to him. Yeah, she was making haste to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you, if you knew that Jesus was calling you and he wanted to meet with you, you you would bolt to go be with Jesus. Verse 30, Now Jesus had not yet come into the village. He has purposely um, halted his progress in coming, coming to Bethany. He has met with Martha already outside the city, but he remains outside the city so that he can have this private conversation with with Mary so that he can individually console her, not in the midst of a large crowd and multitude, but personally, one-on-one. And this really speaks to our personal relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly in a crowd like this, uh, we can meet with Jesus, but he desires to meet with each and every one of us individually and personally. Verse 30, now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where where Martha met him. Then the Jews, and these were those who were mourning with uh, Mary and Martha back at their home, the Jews who were with her, Mary, in the house, consoling her. When they saw Mary get up quickly and went out, they followed her. They did not know that she was going to meet with Jesus because Martha had whispered that secretly in her ear. They assume that Mary is going to the tomb of Jesus to weep and mourn over the tomb. And so these who were in her home, these Jews, instinctively just rose to their feet and followed Mary so that they could comfort her there. Verse 32, Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him. And fell at his feet. She, she just melted. Uh, under the emotional strain of, of losing her brother. And upon seeing the Lord. Upon seeing the Savior now. At last come. Mary just collapses at his feet. And there's no better place to be. Than to be at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Better to be at the feet of Jesus than standing any place else. And so Mary says, Lord, and that too is a strong confession. The Son of God, the Christ who has come into the world, the teacher is also Lord, curios, sovereign one, master. <laughs> He's far more than a carpenter. He, he, he's far more than even just a teacher. He is the Lord of heaven and earth, and Mary believes this, and Mary knows this. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would, have, would not have died. This is not a rebuke to Jesus. This is really a statement of faith, that if you had only been here, that you have the power. You could have healed him and, and made him well. This is actually a statement of great faith on the part of Mary. And it is the part that you, the faith that you and I must have as well. But what I want you to see here is the sensitive spirit 
and the tender heart that Jesus Christ has here, even for, for Mary and, and Martha. Th- th- this was unknown at this time, that someone who is Lord would have this kind of tender affection for these women, Mary and Martha. In Greek mythology uh, at this time that the, the Romans and the Greeks were engulfed in, uh, the, the Greek gods were lukewarm. They were Stoics. That They had no feeling whatsoever for, for creatures here on the earth, at least in the minds of, of those who invented these fictitious characters. And this is so antithetical to views of Greek gods. Here, here is Jesus wanting to meet individually, personally, with, with Mary, and not even to do so in front of other watching eyes, but for this to be a private moment. I, I, I want you to know that you may be exactly where Mary is today. You, you may be going through a very difficult time. You, you may have lost a job. Uh, you may be without income. Uh, You may have lost a family member. Uh, You may be in the midst of your world being turned upside down by all that is taking place. I want you to know that Jesus seeks to meet with you personally and individually. And he cares for you. And he desires to attend to your personal needs. He is calling for you, in fact, for you to leave the crowd and for you to leave the circumstances and to come outside the city, if you will, and to meet alone with Jesus. And ultimately, only Jesus can comfort your troubled heart. Only Jesus can bind up the brokenhearted. Only Jesus can truly Pour the oil of his healing grace into your wounded heart or troubled soul and to make you whole again. So how gracious of Jesus to call for her to come out. So, a sensitive spirit. I want you to note next, deep emotions. In verse 33 and 34, we see the the deep emotions that Jesus felt for his people. In verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, when Jesus saw Mary weeping, now this word weeping means loud wailings. It it, it means a, a loud outpouring of emotion and pain on Mary's part. When Jesus saw her weeping. The Jews who came with her also weeping. This is a scene of intense emotion and sorrow. Please note the result of this. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. This profoundly affected Jesus. Please understand, he is not a stoic sovereign. He is not a mechanical Messiah. He is not a robotic redeemer. He is not just making chess moves in heaven Divorced from any feelings. When Jesus saw her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. This, these words, deeply moved, it's one word in the original. It literally means to snort as a horse. It represents a deep groan from the depth of his humanity. As if to blow out the nose. 
he, he, in the depth of his being. And the word also means to be agitated. He is weeping with those who weep. As Romans 12 tells us, he's not disconnected. He, he's not isolated. He, he is weeping with Mary who is, is, is weeping. And it is the weeping of Mary and Martha that causes Jesus to weep. Think about that. Their weeping led to his weeping. Their weeping caused his weeping. This intense upsurge of emotion is almost like a, 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 a bubbling uh, volcano that could be seen in the face and the countenance of Jesus, could be heard in the tone of his voice. And don't think that was only 2,000 years ago. Jesus is still in glorified humanity. When Jesus returned to heaven, he did not return to a pre-incarnate state. He remained in the fullness of his humanity, now fully in a glorified body. But Jesus still is moved in his spirit when you and I are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, when, when you and I are under the heavy load of sorrow in this world, Jesus feels our sorrow. He, he is a sympathetic high priest at the right hand of God. But in verse 33, there's more. Not only was he deeply moved in spirit, and let me just pause for a moment, in spirit, meaning the very depth of his innermost being. Not a superficial facade level, but in his spirit, we also read, and was troubled. He, he was deeply disturbed. Because Mary and Martha were disturbed. He has entered into their suffering. He is under the same yoke with them. And this word troubled literally means to be stirred up. It's a word that was used earlier in the Gospel of John. In chapter 5, verse 7, the sick man answered Jesus, Sir, we have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. Just like you would put your hand in a bathtub full of water and just begin to swirl it and, and, and stir it up, or put your hand into the sink that's filled up with water, and you just begin to stir the, the water. That's what was taking place inside of Jesus. He wasn't placid. It, it wasn't calm and still on the inside of his heart and soul. He, he was stirred up within himself by their sorrow. What, what a Savior we have. He, he, he left heaven to come into this world of woe. Not to live in a glass bubble, but to get into our skin and stand in our shoes and feel, not just intellectually, but experientially, what we feel. He's been tested at all points, such as we. And so we see the humanity of Christ just shining through this passage. And so in verse 34, Jesus is so ready to step in. He, he, the time is now. His timing is perfect. Where have you laid him? There's no hesitation here. It's just all a matter of timing. It was necessary that Lazarus die so that now there will be a far greater good. Where have you laid him? 
They said to him, Lord, come and see. So here we see the deep emotions of Jesus. And I think of Psalm 34. My mind just immediately went to Psalm 34 as I was putting this together. Listen to Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I can say to you today on the authority of the Word of God that if you are crushed in spirit and if you are broken hearted, the Lord has never been closer to you if you are one of His own. And He feels what you feel. In fact, He feels more than what you feel because He is not only the Son of Man, He is the Son of God as well. Psalm 147, verse 3, The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. What a tender picture this is of the Lord Jesus. But this leads now to verse 35. And I want you to see third, his weeping heart. We now come to the shortest verse in our English Bible. Just two words. Jesus wept. There are no verses in the Bible that tell of Jesus laughing. Surely he did because he was perfect humanity. But we do have this record of Jesus weeping. It is rightly so astonishing that the translators of the Bible have always just singled this out as a verse unto itself so that it, so that it would stand out. When John wrote this, there were not chapters and there were not verses. Those were supplied centuries later. But as they come now to translate this and to, and to put it into writing for, for us as readers, verse 35 is a, is a standalone to draw our attention. So this is not lost in a, in a long sentence or a long verse. It's just these two words, Jesus wept. James Montgomery Boyce writes of these two words, underline it, mark it with red ink, add an exclamation point, print it in capital letters. Jesus wept. Let us be astonished and amazed at this. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached two entire sermons on just these two words. And Spurgeon said, there is infinitely more in these two words than any sermonizer or student of the word will ever be able to bring out of them. Even though he should apply the microscope of the utmost attentive consideration. Close quote. Spurgeon is saying, you could put a microscope over this over these two words, and peer down into them, and you'll never begin to see and to capture all that is bound up in this, that the King of glory wept. Seeing Martha and Mary weeping. And I don't think it's over Lazarus. That's kind of a sentimental devotional thought. Jesus knows what he's getting ready to do with Lazarus. Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. There's no suspense in the mind of Jesus like what's about to happen. Jesus knows what's about to happen. He's going to say, Lazarus, come forth! And he'll come out of that grave. He'll be called out of heaven to come back to the earth. No, it's Mary and Martha. He's weeping as they're weeping. As I've already said, he has entered into their sorrow. And it tears him up on the inside. This word for weep, 
It means to shed tears with heartfelt sorrow. It's the only place where this word is used. And it rightly deserves to just stand alone in our Bible with a lot of white space around it so that these black letters will leap off the page. What do these two words tell us about Jesus? That he was truly a man. That he had emotions like any other man. Yet with far greater love. That he felt sympathy. That he felt compassion. That he felt pity. That he felt grief. He felt it even more than Mary and Martha could feel it. Because he is the son of man. And the son of God. That's the one to whom you pray. Through to the father. You come to the father in the name of Jesus. In the midst of your storms of life. In the midst of your loss. And you have one at the right hand of the Father who not only understands, but who feels what you feel. And what do these two words mean for us? Well, what I just said, that he feels what we feel. He feels because we feel. He feels more than we feel. Listen to Hebrews 5 verse 7. In the days of his flesh, referring to this incarnation, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications, listen to this, with loud crying and tears. Jesus wasn't just going through a checklist flipping the, the uh, moleskin, just kind of going through a checklist. He was pouring out his soul in prayer and feeling for those for whom he prayed. And he continues to make intercession for us at the right hand of God the Father in his glorified humanity with the same intense emotions. There's one last heading I want to set before you. It's in the last two verses that we'll look at today. Verses 36 and 37, number four, tender affections. Anyone standing there could see the tender affections that Jesus had. There there was no hiding it. You couldn't hide. He couldn't hide his feelings. So verse 36, so the Jews were saying, as they're observing this, they have followed Mary out of town where she has now fallen at the feet of, of Jesus, and it's as if they are looking on as outside observers, almost... Um, trespassing into this intimate personal scene. So the Jews were, were watching this, and the only thing they can, can conclude is what they say in verse 36. See how he loved him. Can't you see it? Just look at his face. Listen to his voice. See his tears. See how he loved him. This word loved, you would think, would have been the usual word for love, agapeo. It's not. It's the word phileo, from which, which means brotherly love. But in a sense, this word is so appropriate because agapeo love focuses upon the sacrifice that is made for the one loved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God demonstrated his love toward us. Christ, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 
That agapeo love is the sacrificial giving of yourself to seek the highest good of the one loved. Lust takes, agapeo love gives. So why do I make this point? Because this is not agape love, this is phileo love, which speaks of the emotional feeling of this love. And here, it's not just for Mary and Martha, it's also for him, for Lazarus. That, that there is a, a bond that Jesus feels with his followers. They're they're not just numbers. He he calls his sheep by name, does he not? And he knows Lazarus. And he knows him intimately and and personally. And there is a, a tight emotional bond that he has with those who have turned their backs on the world and who have repented of their sins and who have put their faith and their trust in Him, Jesus wraps His arms around those. And there is a deep attachment, even an emotional attachment, that Jesus feels toward His own. And they see it. And that's what they say. See how He loved Him? This is what the world should see in you and me. John 13, verse 33, or 34 and 35. By this shall all men know that we are his disciples. That we have love one for another. It could be said that the greatest apologetic for our faith in Christ is the love that we demonstrate towards others whom Christ loves with a distinguishing, saving, redeeming love. Think about that. People should be able to say this about you and me. See how she loves her. See how she loves him. See how he loves her. That There is such a bond of fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ among us, that at times it runs deeper than for our own flesh and blood family. Because we are welded together at a far deeper and more profound eternal place because we are in Christ together and we are kindred spirits in the Lord. But here they see His tender affections This word loved was used earlier in this chapter in in verse 3. Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When John comes to write his gospel, the gospel of John, which was the last of the four gospels to be written, it was written about 60 years after all this took place. And so after John, who's had now six decades to review and to reflect in his mind all that happened that occurred to him from John chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book, John chapter 21. In fact, John was the only one, only disciple who was at the foot of the cross. The rest of them scattered. John hung in there. When John writes this gospel, do you know that he never writes his own name? We, we, we have no mention that John is the author of the Gospel of John because John is so overwhelmed that he is given this privilege and he feels so unworthy, he will not even put his name to the Gospel of John. He simply identifies himself this way. It's in John 20, verse 2, in other places, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John says, don't name a city after me. Don't name a hospital after me. 
just remember that I was the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's what Lazarus was. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's what you are, my friend. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the apple of his eye. You are the object of his affection. When you hurt, he hurts. When you rejoice, he rejoices. You are the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, in verse 37, we, we conclude this part of the, of the scene, and there's quite a contrast here in verse 37. It's, it's an eye-opener, and it, and it ends this middle part of the narrative kind of a dose of reality, that not everybody knows Jesus, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, that there are people who are just along for the ride, but they're not really in the car. Verse 37, but some of them said, and there's a note of disdain here. Could not this man, do you not hear a note of cynicism and and sarcasm in that? Could, Could not this man, no mention of the Son of God, no mention of the Christ, no mention of the teacher, no mention of Lord, Could not this man, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man also from dying? Yeah, they're they're second-guessing Jesus already. They're they're, they're already Monday morning quarterbacks. They're, they're, They're already casting scorn at Jesus. Well, if he had gotten here on time, this wouldn't have happened. Well, it was because Jesus came what he did that we will see what will happen in the next weeks. As I bring this to a conclusion, I just want to say three things. Number one, you may be where Mary and Martha are in this story. You may have come to church today with a heavy heart. And you may have ample reason to have sorrow in your heart. It's a part of human experience. And Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I trust that as we have looked at this section of all Sundays, this Sunday, and you're here, for you to see that you have a compassionate, loving, kind, tender Savior. And he's calling for you. And he wants to comfort you. And he wants to console you. You need to meet with Jesus. You need to fall at his feet like Mary. And you need to pour out your heart to Jesus. And he will hear. And he will enter in to your sorrow and he will pour his peace and his comfort into your heart his peace is far greater than your broken heart a second thing that we learn from this we are reminded it's just almost a glimpse of the future that we have a glorious future because the day is coming when he will wipe every tear away from our eyes. And there shall no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. That day is coming when Jesus will literally come to you and just dab the tears from your eyes and say to you, no more. No more heartache. No more sorrow. No more separation, no more loss, no more disappointment, no more discouragement. He'll just remove it all. And we will enter into the celestial city. And there we will live with him forever and ever. 
So this leads to the third and final thing I would say. Not everyone's going to the celestial city. Not everyone will have the tears wiped away from their eyes. In fact, there will be those who will have even greater sorrow and who will have greater tears and who will have greater pain, who will be ever perishing yet never perish, who will be ever dying yet never die. There is a real place called the lake of fire and brimstone in which Christ, instead of wiping away every tear, will inflict such wrath and such torment that the tears will be greater than the lake of fire and brimstone itself. That place is prepared for the devil and for his fallen angels. And Jesus has come into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you have never entrusted your life to Jesus Christ, I urge you to do so this very second, this very moment. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And the Savior is calling you as well. He's calling you. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. How could you possibly refuse an invitation from the Savior? How could you possibly delay Why would you procrastinate? Why would you remain uncertain as to where you stand with him? In your heart right now, go to the Savior who is calling to you and calling for you to come to him, to enter through the narrow gate. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. If you've never come to Christ by faith, his arms are wide open. His heart is wide open. The sacrifice has been made upon the cross. The wedding supper has been prepared. All you must do is come to him by faith and entrust your soul into his saving, forgiving arms. May God do that in your life today if you've never believed upon Christ. Let us pray. Father, what a, what a picture. What a scene. What a drama. What a narrative. We have just looked at today. It's given us insight into the Savior that we have needed. He's not terse. He's tender. He's not crusty. He's compassionate. Bring the truth of these verses home to our hearts. Seal them with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for sending your Son into this world Thank you for making him to be the son of man so that he can enter in to our sorrow and ultimately to be our savior. In Jesus' name, amen.